faithful, joyful, and triumphant. And Sheila said we're now ready for the morning message, and so I'm going to go ahead with it. The theme for our Advent candle, and some people say, are you meaning you're letting the Advent candle control what you're preaching? Well, no, but we have decided at our church to Advent means, you know, to think ahead, to prepare, to look forward to. We are looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. We celebrate his coming into the world, but we're looking forward to the day that he's going to return. And looking forward to Jesus should instill within our hearts some key uh, expressions of gratitude. I look at these as expressions of gratitude. Peace. You know, we should be at peace with God and with others because we've got a right relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. We should have peace. We should have hope. You know, we don't need to, you know, hang our heads and end up saying, you know, it's never going to get better. Eventually, it will get better. It will get better. And it may not be until we get to heaven, but it will get better. So we look forward with anticipation. I tell the folks at the nursing home all the time, and you've heard me say it, I have to remind them, according to the Word of God, the best is not behind us. The best is yet to come. And I do feel bad for the people in the nursing homes because most of them have lived out almost all of their life, and life is no longer at all like it used to be. You know, they've said goodbye to their health. They've said goodbye to family and loved ones. They've said goodbye to their homes. They've lost an awful lot, and they look back with sadness, and they end up thinking, man, oh, man, I've lost everything that mattered to me. And the Word of God says, oh, no. You may have not had it right now, but there is a great day coming that you and I really need to look forward to. So the best is yet to come. Today's message, as we think about the Advent candle, is that you and I need to have joy. And as I said during Sunday school, these aren't exactly joyous times uh, as we look around. We were not allowed to assemble together, you know, even shopping. We go out in public and we have to wear these masks across our face social distance from people. I even said when I came in the uh, door this morning that when we do resume services, I'm thinking about marking off every other parking place in the parking lot so there are cars with social distance. Some people say it's not something to joke about. Well, I'm just saying that it's terrible the way that our lives have just been so turned upside down. And I miss the good old times. And so it, it, it can really create some sadness within our lives. So I want us this morning to focus upon trying to get some joy in our life about Jesus Christ. I know that oftentimes I've preached a message that joy is really an acronym, Jesus, others, and you. But this year I'm not going to use that as, as my main focus. I want us to look at um, Luke chapter 2, verse 10. It was not necessarily included in our Advent reading this morning, but it was from the same, some of it came from Luke chapter 2. And it says this in Luke chapter 2, and this is when the angel was talking to the shepherds. The angel said to them, meaning the shepherds, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So this morning I want to to so stop and think about what's this, what is this good news of great joy that's for all of us people. I know that my message this morning is maybe in some ways simplistic. I'm a simplistic sort of person. But I want to focus just upon three things that I think that we can be joyous about as we think about Jesus Christ. And some of you will say, well, I already know these things and they don't bring me any joy. And I find that it's unfortunate if we still don't find joy from these three things. The three things that I want to focus on this morning that we need to find joy on. First is, our salvation comes from Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking in particular about forgiveness of sins. I want you, for those of you that have your Bibles, if you look back in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. This is when the angel is speaking to Joseph. 
and telling Joseph, you know, J Joseph, I don't want you to divorce Mary. I want you to go ahead and marry Mary. It says in verse 20, but after he had considered divorcing Mary, putting her away privately, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Here's the part to focus on. Give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So when I am thinking about the joy, one of the things that I need to be finding joy in about the birth of Jesus is the fact that I have been saved from my sins because of Jesus. People say, what do you mean saved from your sins? Well, there's a punishment for sin. If, if we took time, and I'm not going to do that this morning, but if you went back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, it talks about it in Genesis chapter 2. This is when Adam and Eve are in the garden. And God has issued them a warning that if they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they are going to die. In the day that you eat thereof, from this tree, you're going to die. There is a death penalty for sin, and that's, what, that's where death came from. According to the Bible, death is a penalty for sin. And I know that some people end up saying, well, I just think that death is just the result of natural causes that the body eventually just kind of wears out and it ends up dying. That's not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches that death came as punishment for sin. Death was never part of God's original, original plan for us. We chose the road that we were going to go on and, and you and I say, well, I didn't live back then. I didn't make the choice. Adam and Eve, they made the choice for all of humanity. They ended up sinning. And we read later on in the book of Romans that it says that the wages of sin is death. It's just reinforcing what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. We deserve to die because of our sins. And I don't want to do this very long, but I just want to ask you the question... Do you ever sit back and reflect in your life about sins that you've committed? By the way, I'm not encouraging you to do this. I'm just asking if you ever find yourself doing that. I will tell you what's going on when that happens. Satan is working on you. You're allowing yourself to be worked on by Satan. Because Satan is the one, Satan is called in the Bible the accuser of the brethren. His role is to constantly fault find and to, to bring to our mind those things that will bring us back down and will destroy us and make us feel bad about ourselves. And I'm just saying, I don't want us to focus upon the stuff that's happened because I believe very much what Corey Tenboom ended up saying when God forgives us. And he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. He puts up a little sign that says no fishing. When God removes that from us as far as the east is from the west. He wants it to be part of our past. Just let it go. It's already been forgiven. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Not only forgive us. But to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God takes care of that. But I'm just... Helping us to think at Christmas time. One of the things that you and I to be joyous about. There's a lot from our past that we wish that we had never done. Am I right? Not only things that we've done, things that we've said, things that we thought. And I'm, I'm telling you, this is what Satan does to me. And I'm sure that he's doing it to you too. Because I, I get people within the church many times that they will end up having something bad start to go on in their life and they will end up saying to me, Pastor, do you think that this is punishment for something that I did? I'm being punished 
for something that I've ended up doing. People live with this thing because Satan is behind the scenes constantly condemning them for the sins that they've committed. And the Bible tells us that Jesus came to save us from all of those sins. I don't care if it was something back in your childhood. I don't care if it was something that you did yesterday. I don't care if it was something just almost heinous because it was so, so evil or something that was just almost trivial. And yet, that trivial thing, it still eats away at you. You know that you did wrong. I don't care what it was. By all rights, you and I should be scared about God's condemnation. By all rights, we should. Because we serve a righteous and a holy God. The good news of the Christmas story, Jesus came to give us joy. And part of that joy is the promise of forgiveness of sins. That's what it says in Matthew when I read the 20th and 21st sermon. You're going to call him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. Woo! -hoo! Praise the Lord. I don't have to worry about all those sins. The load has been lifted. The penalty has been paid. You know what the scripture actually says? How did Jesus end up saving us from our sins? If you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and again... I'm not going to turn there. The Apostle Paul says, I passed on to you what was of first or utmost important. And when he starts this list of things that he was reminded the church at Corinth that he had passed on to them, he says the first and foremost thing, Jesus died for our sins. You know what I honestly believe as a pastor? Is that when God made that pronouncement in Genesis, in the day that you sin, you're going to die. And then later in the book of Romans says the wages of sin is death. Every person is going to have to pay a death penalty for their sins. Every person that comes into this world has a death penalty that's going to have to be paid. And the good news is, for those of us that are Christians, my death penalty has been paid. Jesus paid my death penalty by dying for me, Jesus died for our sins. And that's something that you and I should live with joy every day. I don't know when my end is going to come. I sometimes will say that from time to time here at the church. I don't know. The Lord may call me home later today. It might be this week. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I sure am joyous to know that when that time comes, my sin debt has been paid. Jesus Christ has already paid the price of my sins. And I am forever grateful that Jesus Christ has set me free. The second thing that Jesus Christ has ended up doing for us, He has ended up giving us His presence. Again, looking at that passage of Scripture from Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. I've already told you that Jesus is going to save His people from their sins. If you'll read down just a little bit further... I'm going to the 22nd and 23rd verses now. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Here's the second part of my message that you and I need to give joy with. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. It doesn't matter what happens to me in the future. I can live with the assurance that I am not alone. God is with me. During the Sunday school class, Miss Bessie brought up from Psalm 139. Said, even if I go to the depths of hell, even there, God's presence is already there. And I'll say this with regard to hell. <coughs> if a person goes to hell... In the judgment, God's presence isn't going to accompany you to hell. You're going to go alone. In fact, the Bible says it's not hell so much. Jesus does say in, I think it's Matthew chapter 10, that we should not fear man that can destroy the body, but we should fear the one who has the 
power to cast both the body and soul in hell. So Jesus does talk about hell as kind of a final place of judgment. But over in the book of Revelation, it says that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. So I'm just trying to point out that hell is, is a place that you and I don't want to go because God's presence isn't going to be there. Here's the thing that we need to be joyous about. Because Jesus has come and his name is Emmanuel, it doesn't matter where we go. God is there with us. During that time that I felt alone, on I, I shared this during the Sunday school hour, I was at home on a Thursday, Thursday night, and I just kind of felt so isolated from everybody. As I shared in Sunday school class, uh, my life has been totally disrupted. I can't go to the nursing homes anymore and have contact with people. I can't go to hospitals and visit people. Even our church services, we're very limited on who can end up coming to church services. Um, I can't go really to people's homes because people don't want me. And I just kind of feel very alone. I talk with my parents. Um, but anyhow, while I was at home on Thursday night, got down on my knees, ended up saying, Lord, but I know that you're with me. And you'll never leave me. And that brought me joy. I know that my mom recently had commented to me, and I shared this with you. She said, every time I go into the hospital for some sort of a surgical procedure and they get ready to wheel me back, she says, I lay there on the gurney and I say one more time, hey Lord, it's just you and me again. Nobody else around, it's just you and me. And the good news is, the angel said, Jesus' name is going to be Emmanuel. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, God's with you. Uh, even mentioned this, one of the people that watches the program very faithfully, Gina, in a care facility, she shared with me the other day that she uh, was kind of being isolated, and uh, I just ended up saying, you know what, God's with you. The good news is, you and I are never alone. Because his name is Emmanuel. God is with us. I ended up, I don't want to draw this out too long, but I end up thinking about the Apostle Paul. I told you this story the other day. It was the Apostle Paul, it was Peter, that James, the brother of John, had been killed. This was in the book of Acts. I think it's around the 11th chapter. I'd have to go back and look at my references again. But, the brother of John, James, one of the two sons of thunder, got executed. And Herod saw that it pleased the people so much that the next day he was intending to kill Peter. And instead of Peter getting killed, Peter got delivered from prison. And people might end up saying, well, why was God with Peter and God wasn't with James? And my response was, God was with both of them. Just because something happens that you and I don't want to have happen doesn't mean that God is not with us. I believe that it's when we're needing God the most that God is the most present with us. And I feel like that when that time comes for us, it's nice to know when nobody else can do anything for us, God is there holding our hands. He's there with us. The last thing that I wanted to say with regard to this message that we can find joy in, again, these are not earth-shaking concepts, but it's things that we should rejoice in. It comes from one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and I don't mean that lightly. It's one of the passages of Scripture that I probably quote the most at funerals. Yeah, a lot of times I will quote John 3.16, but I'm talking about John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, where Jesus has told those disciples, he said, guys, at the end of the 13th chapter, he's warned them. He said, guys, I'm, I'm going to be leaving you. And I'm no longer going to be here beside you. And I know you guys are going to be sad. But I don't want your hearts to be troubled. You guys believe in God. I want you to have that kind of faith in me also. Believe also in me. Because I want to tell you something. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. And if that wasn't the case, I would have told you. I'm going to go there and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I'm going to come and get you and take you to be there with me so that where I am, there you can be also. And for me, the one thing that gives me great joy in knowing that when my time runs out, God has a place for me. I pray that as we go through this Christmas season, there's people, I talk with them all the time, families are not getting together for Christmas. Even people that live locally are hesitant about having their family members come into the house for fear of bringing something into the house and taking the life of a loved one. It leaves us very despondent because quite honestly, even though all of the decorations and the gifts are nice, what makes this season special is family and being connected with others. We can lose our joy during the Christmas season. And I appreciated the, the passage of scripture that Miss Bessie included from Philippians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Christians there in Philippi, ended up saying there, Folks, listen, I want you to never lose your joy. I want you to rejoice always. And I'm going to say it again, rejoice. Rejoice about what? This morning I've tried to give you three things that you can rejoice about. First of all, rejoice for your salvation. You've been saved. Your debt has been paid. Your debt has already been paid through Jesus Christ. Rejoice that you have been saved. Rejoice that God is going to be with you no matter what happens. You know, you're never going to be alone. And last but not least, rejoice that if it should be the end of your time here, you've got a home to go to. Jesus has gone and prepared a place so that you will have a place to go to when your time is up here. People might say to me, well, how can I know Jesus? You come to know Jesus by asking Jesus, well, Jesus, I really do believe in you. I believe that you are a real person, and I believe that you did come from God in order to save people. I believe that you want me to turn away from, you know, the way that I've lived my life and turn my life over to you. And I believe in you so much, I'm giving you today my heart. I want to live for you. I want you to come into my heart. I want you to live inside of me. I want you to help me to become like you and become the person that you want me to be. I want you to save me from my sins. The Bible says that when a person will do that, Jesus will end up saving him. Jesus came to seek and to save those that are lost. You can know the true joy of Christmas. True, true joy of Christmas is Jesus Christ. Would you have prayer with me, please? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to remind us of some very basic teachings from your word. It is very depressing this year, the way that Christmas has, in some ways, almost been stolen from us. We can't enjoy it as we usually did. And Father, that can end up leaving, leaving us with a joy, joyless experience. I pray, Father, that you might help us to recapture that joy. Joy is knowing down in our hearts these, these fundamental things that it doesn't matter what's going on around us. We can live with joy knowing our sins have been paid for. We're headed to heaven because Jesus has made a way for us. We can live with joy knowing that he is going to accompany us all the way to heaven's throne. And Father, may we know that he is with us. His name is Emmanuel. And then finally, Father, may we live with joy knowing You've got a great place prepared for us. This place is nice, but it's nothing compared to what you have promised for those who believe. I pray, Father, that you might help us to rejoice this Christmas and that we might encourage others to find joy in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.